Hello, I am Michael Hayward, and I'm going to be talking about the app that Sklo Library developed. The app is called My Library Card, and it was available on Google Play and the Apple iTunes Store. The purpose of the app was to hold multiple library cards for our patrons to make it easier to access. The app grew out of our strategic plan, which idea basically stated we are where you are. Basically, this idea was that the library is more than the physical building. We wanted to be basically everywhere where the patron is. We wanted to be available on their mobile phones or at home on their computers, even when the library is closed. To fulfill this plan, we started with upgrading our website, where we made it more user and mobile friendly, and we revamped our card signup process to make it easier for patrons to get cards. So the idea was that Mary Sue, who woke up at 2 a.m. in the morning, would be able to log onto our website, sign up for a library card, and then immediately get access to items on OverDrive so she could start reading the newest James Patterson book. So as you can see here on the first slide, a quote from one of our patrons said that they are way more excited about this than they should be. Probably. So let's first talk about library cards. So, as we all know, the library card is the key to unlocking library services. With it, you can access physical books from, and take them out from our library. You can access online ebooks and download them to your devices. You also use your library card to log into our website and request or renew your books. And also with your library card, you can access online resources. So the library card's really awesome, but our patrons have a problem. And that problem is they have too many library cards, or they have too many cards. As you can see here, this woman is clearly overwhelmed with the number of cards that she has to carry with her. If you think about it, people have to carry around their credit cards, their insurance cards, library cards, they have to carry around photo IDs, any kind of loyalty cards they have, and these cards all add up after a while. What this ends up being is that patrons they have limited space. So what happens is that some of the less important cards get left at home. No matter how hard we try to tell the patrons that the library card is the most important card in their wallet, they're not going to listen to us, especially when it comes to things like credit cards and insurance cards. So the patrons will leave them at home, or they'll forget about them. And then when the patrons don't have the library cards, what this leads into is that they can't use all those great resources that the library card unlocks. When they come to the library, they're not able to check out books unless they have a photo ID. And then that leads to other issues that involves using extra staff time to look up the patron by their name. And that can lead to errors if John Smith 1 wants to check out books and we accidentally check it out on John Smith 10's account. So we looked at this, and we looked at how we had revamped the process of using the library cards to make it easier, and revamped the process for signing up for library cards and made it easier. And we wanted a 21st century solution that empowers our patrons to carry the library card with them. So the question becomes, what is this solution? What fits in to this space? to augment the library card or complement the library card. Because we didn't want to remove the library card. It was, it's too important. But we wanted to supply an optional way. And the idea we came up with was very simple. We just wanted an app that could hold a library card. And as with most simple ideas, there's an app for that. In fact, there's two. There's Keyring and there's Stowcard. And both of these apps are available on both Android and iPhones. And they can both hold all of your loyalty cards. So if you have a Panera card, a Best Buy card, a library card, they can hold all the cards. And we looked at these apps and we thought, these are good, but there's a problem with them. And the problem is that patron privacy matters. These apps, even though they may have no intent to maliciously use patron information on their cell phones or devices, they still require information like the device ID, the patron's profile, photo access, camera access. And we weren't comfortable suggesting a third-party solution for this because we didn't have any control over these apps. If we were to suggest these apps for our patrons and 
at some point down the line they did start using this information maliciously, then we would have no control over it, and we would be the ones who suggested it in the first place. That is what led us to create our own app. We wanted to create something lightweight that didn't have all these extra permissions. So we got to work. And just for reference, before we did any work on this, we weren't expert programmers, but we did have some knowledge of programming. But we had never made an app before. Nobody on our team had ever made an app before. So we were basically going in blind. All right, so as you can see here on the slide, this is the first version of our app. And you can see how inexperienced we were based on the design of the app. The app was very simple. It just would hold a library card, and then it had links to our website for other services. Um, this one was built with Swift, a programming language used to make iOS or iPhone apps. Now, we could have used this app, and it would have worked mostly fine for our purpose, but the problem with this was that the Android phone users would be unsupported. Basically, anybody who had an iPhone would have an app, but if they had an Android phone, they'd be out of luck. So we looked into this further, and we found that if somebody wanted to create an Android app, they would also have to program it in a programming language called Java. So we would have this app, the iPhone one, and then we would have to create an additional app with Java. And that would involve maintaining two code bases for two different apps. And at this point, we decided to put the app on hold and to look into it further and do some more research. And it wasn't until we had a patron ask a question through Ask Here PA that we delved right back in. Their question was, how do I make a multi-platform chat app? Multi-platform being for both iPhone and Android. And so we looked into the available options. There's things like Xamarin Studio, which allows you to program in C Sharp. And there's a, another option called PhoneGap that allows you to create an app with HTML and JavaScript and CSS. But we went with an open source solution called Cordova. And Cordova, like PhoneGap, allows you to create apps for both iPhone and Android with HTML and CSS. Basically, you're making a website and then you're using Cordova as the framework. If you want to think about it as an analogy, you can think of it like the website you're making is the picture and Cordova is the frame with which you put the picture in to display it. So here's the second draft of the app. It's very simple. You would put in your library card number and at this point we decided to use a PIN number to authenticate the library cards that was being entered into the app. And when you entered in, when you hit log in, it would display the barcode. Now this is very simple. It holds one card and you could log in, log out, and change it if you wanted to. And we also had a link to our website on there if they wanted to check their account. Now this is okay, but we decided that we wanted to look further into options for making our app look better, for a better design. So at this point, we found a platform built on top of Cordova called Ionic. And what Ionic supplies you with is basically they give you the components to make an app. So if you want a button, they give you a button. If you want a menu, they give you a menu. And you get to decide what's in the buttons and what's in the menus and what the buttons and the menus do, but they style it for you. So most of the work is taken care of already. So once we found Ionic, we started running with it. And we made a, the third version of their app. And with this version of the app, it would also display the, the card on the screen just like the last one would. But with this version, you, there was a slide out menu on the left hand side that would also allow you to look at the items you had checked out or the items you had on request. And then we did some research into library apps themselves. And we found that people didn't review them favorably. There was a lot of people who got on and said, oh, why can't the app do this? Why can't the app show me the items that are available for me on hold? Or why can't the app tell me when my items are due? And it's not my fault the items are late, it's the app's fault because it didn't tell me the items are due. So we took a step back and looked at what we wanted the functionality of the app to be. And we decided that we didn't want all those extra bells and whistles of the other apps. We just wanted an app that did one thing and did one thing really well. So this was kind of like when the light bulb went on for us. 
because we wanted a simple app. And we decided we wanted it to be simple but powerful. And we also decided that it would have a unique identity in that it would only hold library cards, but what it would do is it would hold multiple library cards. What our communication manager had proposed was that it could hold all the library cards for the entire family. And when she said this, the idea for the app all fell into place, the marketing for the app and the app itself, what we wanted the app to do. Because once we had this piece, we thought about the mom who came up to the circulation desk with four library cards on her keychain, and she said, I have all these library cards. One of them is mine, but I don't know which one it is. At this point, we also looked at the upgrade we did to our website and how we wanted to reduce the redundancy between what the app does and what the website does. We wanted the two to be a cohesive experience, but we wanted the app to hold the cards and we wanted the patrons to the website if they wanted to request items or if they wanted to renew their items or anything to do with their account. So in this way, it actually made it easier to develop because then we didn't have to maintain two different code bases. Anytime we wanted to make a change on the website, we would just change it on the website and not worry about changing it on the app also. So that reduced the redundancy of having to, to do all those updates. So then we did the next version of the app. And with this version, you can start to see the idea of holding multiple cards evolve. As you can see here, that's my mom's card and my card in the app. And then there was a slide out menu on the left, which we used to add or remove the virtual cards. And at the bottom, you can see a link to our website. Now, the problem we found with this one was that the menu on the left-hand side wasn't very intuitive to use, and we also wanted to create a cohesive experience with our website, so we wanted to make it look like our website. Here's the mobile version of our website. As you can see, it's very simple. There is a menu on the top left-hand corner, a button to log in, our logo, the search bar, and then the content of the website itself. So we wanted to mimic that with the app. And then here's the app version that we tried to copy the website. So in the app, it has the menu, the login, logo, search bar, and then the content of the app. And at this point, we took the left-hand slide menu and moved it to the bottom and made it tabs. And we did some user testing with this and found that actually the tabs weren't very usable either. And this is the point where we had to really think about where we wanted the functions to be. And what it turns out is, if you just put the functions right where they're needed most, it makes the most sense. So for example, the Add Cards button, we moved up to where the cards were, and we embedded the Remove Card into the card itself. So here's actually the final draft of the app, and you can see here where we moved the Plus Card button is just right beneath the cards themselves. We also moved the help button from the previous version up to where the eCards is because that help button links to help for the app. And then we added a button at the bottom for calling SCLO for any help that they needed. So if they were using it on an iPhone, it would immediately call SCLO. So after we had a version of the app that we liked, we had to test it. So we loaded it up on staff iPhones and Android phones, and we just started testing it out to make sure all the functions worked. And we caught a few things, things like making sure that the app was locked so the screen wouldn't move, so that when the patron was handing the app to somebody at the circulation desk, they didn't have to do the hokey pokey to try to get the screen lined up correctly. And then once we decided that we were done with testing, we needed to acquire developer licenses for both the Google Play Store and the iTunes store. And as far as costs go, this is really a necessity. You can't really avoid these because these are the only ways that you can distribute the app to the patrons. If you don't have these, then there's really no way for you to give the app to your patron easily. As you can see from the slide, the cost for a Google Play license is $25, it's one-time fee, and the cost for an iTunes license is $99, but that's per year. So to upkeep that cost, you'll have to pay $99 every year. And then once we did that, we had to basically package the app up and then submit it to the iTunes app and Google Play Store. We also had to create graphics and descriptions of the app for the stores too. 
And we also use that in our social media and marketing as well. And then it was waiting. So the Google Play approved our app within half of a day. So it was pretty much immediate. The iTunes store that is run by Apple, on the other hand, took a few weeks to actually get approved. When we originally submitted it, Apple said that they didn't really like how we had connected our app with our website. So when you use the menu links on our app, it links to the website by opening up the browser in the phone itself. And they thought it should open up in the app. And we talked to them about it, and eventually they relented and published the app for us. But that was about three weeks later. So we launched February 10th, and since then we had about 190 installs on Android and about 140 installs on iPhones at the very least. And we also had about 700 cards added to the app. And if you do the math, that's about two cards per install. So people are actually using the app in the way we attended it to. They are putting multiple cards and they're storing them on one app. So that was a good, that was a good sign for us. That was the sign that we were doing really well. But then we started getting some tweets about the app. The first one is actually a library in Canada, in Quebec. And when we, when we saw this, we said that our app had gone multilingual. And also, here is another tweet by our local radio station. And they said, check out the app of the day. And they, this was basically their, their first app of the day, too. And we didn't reach out to them to do this at all. They just did this all on their own. And we were actually really excited that people were really excited about the app. Here's some reviews that we were excited about getting to. You can see here, great, this app is wonderful. It accomplishes its main purpose. It does exactly what it says it does. It's super easy to get, install, and use. So you can see the idea that the app is really easy to use. It accomplishes its purpose, and the people are excited about using it instead of having to carry around their library card with them. So how much time did we sink into this? because it definitely took a lot of time learning, researching, and then developing. So here you can see a breakdown of an estimated time in hours. So you can see most of the time was spent developing all the different versions and all the different drafts of the app to get it to where we were comfortable with it. We also had to do a lot of learning. We had to learn first how to learn how to program in Swift, how to program in JavaScript, how to use the tools to create these apps. And then we also did a lot of research into the options into making apps themselves. And then there's a little bit of time spent testing and a little bit of time spent publishing. If you add this all up, it's about two weeks worth of time total. Not work hours, but just two weeks. And then how much did we spend on the app? The total cost that we spent out of our budget was $124. And that was it. We didn't spend any other money on anything else. And that's actually the cost of the two licenses themselves. So the $25 for the Google Play and the $99 for the iTunes App Store. And then the upkeep cost that we'll be paying every year for the app is $99. So we're not paying any extra licensing or anything like that. It's just $99 every year. Other things that you might have to buy if you were to develop an app yourself is you might have to buy some kind of Mac computer and then some kind of iPhone or iOS device, like an iPad or something. Because in order to distribute the app on the iTunes store, you need to have both a MacBook and an iOS device to be able to distribute it on the store. And then the other thing you need is, if you're going to allow patrons to use this, you're going to be able to need to read barcodes off the phone screen. And most laser scanners can't read the screen of a phone. So you're going to have to invest in optical scanners instead. And those can run between about $175 and 